Topic Notes 2.1, Chemistry of Water and Salinity. The Earth is really known as a blue planet, and part of understanding that is understanding the chemistry of water, and that's what our note set is going to be about today. This picture actually is of our, one of our students in the academy taking a sample of water and determining salinity using a refractometer out in the Lake Worth Lagoon. This is just one of the many things you're going to learn how to do. So, let's get started. It's always a good idea to understand the main idea of what you're about to learn. And in this case, it's that the chemistry of the ocean water is defined by the polar nature of water molecules. Salinity, dissolved gases, the pH, and of course temperature. Of course, now we need to get into the weeds and understand all the different learning goals that you're going to be covering. Remember, I will present you with the list of learning goals at the beginning of each note set. You also will have them in the learning scales you receive in class. These are the targeted items that you're going to be responsible for. This unit is called Blue Planet, and there's a good reason for that. As it states on the slide, water covers 71% of the Earth's surface. That's a lot, making this quite a blue world. And beyond that, if you look at the depth of the ocean, the volume, it holds 99% of the biosphere, which is the habitable space on the planet. So when we talk about marine biology, when you learn about marine science, you're learning about the majority of the planet. And the oceans have a big impact even on land masses. And we're going to learn about that as well. So this really is a water planet. Now, of course, the focus of what we're going to be talking about today has to do with the water molecule itself. As you probably know from learning way back and probably even elementary school, water is made up of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, thus the term H2O. Now, if you remember back uh, in your chemistry, if you look at the periodic table, oxygen has an atomic number of eight. It's also on the second period, or the second row, of the periodic table. That means it has two electron shells. The first shell is completely full with two electrons. And remember, the first shell, or the first period, can only have two electrons. The second shell has a total of six electrons. And again, that second shell, if you remember, can hold up to eight electrons, but it only has six. To be a stable, happy little oxygen molecule, it wants to fill up that electron shell and get two more additional electrons in there to fill it to eight. Now, if you remember back to the periodic table, oxygen is part of the nonmetals, and it's an electronegative element, meaning that it doesn't like to get rid of electrons. So it's not likely to become an ion and form an ionic bond. On the other hand, hydrogen just has one proton and one electron. So only one electron in its only shell. Now again, that first shell can hold up to two electrons. So the hydrogen kind of wants another electron. So we end up forming a covalent bond between the oxygen and the two hydrogen atoms. That means they're going to share electrons. This creates two bonding pairs, one with each hydrogen atom and the oxygen. This makes oxygen kind of feel like a full uh, eight electrons in its outer shell and the same with hydrogen with a slight problem. Hydrogen kind of gets the short end of the stick because Oxygen, if you remember, is an electron-hogging element. That means that the electrons, the shared electrons, are spending more of their time around oxygen than the hydrogens. This unequal sharing is huge. It creates what a special type of covalent bond called a polar covalent bond. And that type of bond is responsible for life on this planet. You see, Oxygen, because it's having those two extra electrons around it most of the time, has a partial negative charge to it. And the hydrogens, because they're losing their electron most of the time, have a partial positive charge. 
that means the water molecule itself has poles, positive and negative regions. Now these are not full charges, they're partial charges. Now these partial charged regions of the water molecules result in something we call hydrogen bonds. Basically what we mean is all of these water molecules that are bouncing around each other have weak attractions to the positive and negative regions of each other's molecules. These weak attractions break and form, break and form, but in totality they change the chemistry of water. Now that's enough chemistry for the purposes of this course. Uh, however, keep in mind there is more to come if you continue on in your educational career. But for this point in time, let's focus on the effects of these hydrogen bonds and how important they are to life on this planet. We'll start with water as it is at room temperature. Most people don't realize without hydrogen bonding, water would actually be a gas at room temperature, which of course wouldn't really work so well considering most of our bodies are, of course, liquid, right? So that's really important. The other aspect of this is cohesion and adhesion. Really what this is talking about is water molecules sticking to things, either sticking to each other, cohesion, being cohesive, or sticking to other things, adhesion. Now you'll notice a lot of these characteristics are sort of connected. High surface tension is basically caused through cohesion. It's water's resistance to objects attempting to penetrate its surface. So if you look at the little insect skating on the water on the picture on the right, that is an example of high surface tension. The insect is too light. It doesn't have enough weight to break the hydrogen bonds at the surface of the water. So surface tension is really an effect of cohesion, which of course is an effect of hydrogen bonding. Similarly, water has a high viscosity or resistance to flow. And you probably could tell this from experience if you've ever swam in water before. It's a lot thicker than it is in air. So that's all it's really talking about. And again, considering without hydrogen bonding, water would most likely be a gas at room temperature, it does increase the viscosity of water to have hydrogen bonding. Water also has what we call high heat capacity. This is really important as well. Think about it. If you are going to put a pot of water on a stove, you're adding heat to increase the temperature. Well, temperature is really a measure of the activity of, and of the molecules within that liquid. How fast are the molecules bouncing around? You add energy, they start bouncing around faster, you increase the temperature. Well, with water, because of hydrogen bonding, the stickiness of the water molecules together, it takes more energy input to raise the temperature. So, water has a high heat capacity. You have to add a lot more energy to get the water to change temperature than other like liquids. This is really important when you're considering water as a habitat for marine life or aquatic life in general. It means that it's a very stable place to live because no matter what's going on, the temperature is going to change rather slowly. It's not going to heat up very quickly or cool down very quickly. And of course, living things need a stable environment to live in. So that's really important. Another characteristic is ice. When most matter transitions from a liquid to a solid, the density increases. That doesn't happen with water. When water freezes, the hydrogen bonds spread the molecules into a crystal-like structure that takes up more space, otherwise it's less dense than the surrounding liquid water. It's very strange considering. Now, this isn't news to you because I'm sure you've noticed ice cubes floating in your glasses of water or soda or whatever for like ever, but it is unusual for nature. It also allows ice to be an insulator for the water below it, meaning as water freezes, it'll freeze at the top of the water, insulating the temperature of the water below. 
This happens a lot in lakes up north, and it allows animals, uh, fish and whatnot, to survive through the winters instead of the lakes freezing completely. Okay, so just a couple of quick terms uh, to get us ready to talk about salinity. These are two terms you've probably heard before, solution versus a mixture. When we're talking about a solution, we're talking about a homo homogeneously dispersed situation, kind of like salt, which we're going to talk about, obviously. Sugar is the same way. If you ever put sugar in a glass of water and mix it around, the sugar completely disappears. That's because water is the solvent, sugar is the solute, and it becomes a solution. A mixture is different. A mixture is kind of like a salad. You put lettuce in, you put the tomatoes and the croutons, and they all stay lettuce, tomato, and croutons. There's not much difference. Here in the picture on the bottom right, you'll notice the cup of sand. That's an example of a mixture in nature. Uh, the sand doesn't dissolve in the water, so to speak, although there is some dissolving of minerals in the sand in the mock, but we won't get into that right now. But the salt and the sugar totally uh, dissolve within the solution of water. And now, of course, remember, water is the universal solvent, and that is because of its polar nature, you now with those positive and negative partial charges. So now we come to talk about salt. Um, now salt comes in a couple of different forms, but the majority of salt is sodium chloride. Interestingly enough, in and of themselves, sodium and chloride separately are kind of dangerous. I actually had an experience with an old chunk of rock sodium at the science museum back when I was volunteering, and we literally melted a beaker with the stuff uh, without realizing what we were doing. So very dangerous. And chlorine, of course, if you've ever dealt with pool, uh, know that it's very dangerous as well. Uh, and you have to be very, very careful with it. Now, sodium only has one valence electron in its outer shell. And thus, it's really easy for it to get rid of that electron. And by doing so, it becomes a positive ion. Chlorine, of course, is electronegative, and it's not going to want to get rid of anything, but it will accept that extra electron from sodium and thus becoming a negative ion. Now, sodium being a positive one ion and chlorine being a, po a negative one ion, they come together, forming an ionic bond and, of course, salt, sodium chloride, that you can put on your french fries and eat. Yay! Now, water, being a polar molecule with partial positive and negative regions, can take that salt, that sodium chloride, and disassociate the sodium and the chloride. This keeps salt in the solution and it effectively dissolves it, meaning that you really don't see the salt anymore once you mix it up. So now we can talk about salinity in and of itself. So salinity includes the total quantity of dissolved inorganic solids in seawater. Now you're going to say, what the heck does inorganic solids mean? And what we're really talking about is salt. Sodium chloride is inorganic. It doesn't have a carbon atom in it. Well, there are other inorganic salts as well that we'll talk about. So that's all that means. So as an example, if you have a thousand gram sample of seawater, it'll tend to contain about 35 grams of dissolved inorganic compounds, collectively called salts. Hence what we start to get into the part of parts per thousand, or salinity is basically expressed in parts per thousand. And the average ocean salinity is around 35 parts per thousand. Now you can go PPT or you can do the little percent sign with the extra zero, and there you go. Now the image on the right there shows you a little bit more about what different salinities are in various different types of habitats, and we'll get into that later. So I mentioned that there are other salts. There are six inorganic salts that make up about 99.28% of all of the inorganic salts that we talk about in dissolved in water, in seawater. Sodium and chloride are obviously among the top, okay? But also sulfate, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. Those are kind of the big six. And there are also smaller quantities, what we call trace uh, elements that are dissolved in there as well. Now, this may seem a little bit more complicated, but in the way, if you look at it, it's actually not. Um, these are things that we need even as human beings. You know, we need calcium as we grow up. Well, if you think about it, a lot of the marine life out there need some of these different um, salts to grow as well. 
Now, if you remember from our History of Oceanography talk, the Challenger expedition in 1876 sampled all sorts of different water from around the world. And a scientist named William Dittmar actually analyzed it. Now, he found that those six of those major inorganic constituents, those salts that we just talked about, were in every sample. And more so than anything, they actually existed in the same percentages or ratios. This is regardless of what actual concentration they were in terms of 35, 40 parts per thousand, 20 parts per thousand. The ratios between them were always the same. This is called the theory of constant proportions and generally works out across the ocean basins. There are, of course, other micronutrients found at various small concentrations all over as well. So now we come to the part of how do we actually measure salt? Now we're going to do this in a lab, so I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot here, but there are various methods. On the left, you'll see a device called a CTD sensor or a conductivity temperature and depth sensor. We can drop these off of the bow of a ship or back of the ship and really get a profile of the chemistry of the water at depth. Um, here in school, we're going to use what we call a refractometer, which actually measures the bending of light through the water. And that's different based on how much salinity is in the water. And you'll look through this little device and you'll see uh, a little circle with scales, just like you see here on the right of this image. The scale to the right is your parts per thousand, that percent sign with that extra zero there. On the left, we're actually looking at specific gravity, which has a little bit to do with density. Um, we're not going to worry about that. And of course, the demarcation between the blue and the white area, that line that crosses the scale, that's where you're going to read the salinity. Now, having salts in the water creates a little difference in the terms of the type of properties the water has. We call this change uh, a colligative properties. This leads to some rather important properties changing. For example, salt water tends to be more of an electrolyte, meaning it can conduct an electrical current better than fresh water. There's a decreased heat capacity, the boiling point raises, decreased freezing temperatures, and slowed evaporation. And almost the most important to think about in terms of salt water in marine life is the increase in osmotic pressure. And we're going to talk about that in another note set. So now it's time to ask the question, why is water salty anyway? Where did it all come from? And the truth is, it happened over large geologic time scales. And it's also because of water's ability as a solvent, a universal solvent, as they say. Because of that polar nature of the molecule, it can dissolve lots of stuff. So all of that water running off of land, be it from rivers and streams or runoff of various ways, runs across rocks and sediment and soil, and it dissolves lots of inorganic constituents that eventually get concentrated in the ocean as salts. There are also salts that come from the inside of the earth. Volcanoes, not only above ground, but also underwater, uh, spew out material on the seafloor. Vents, hydrothermal vents, which we'll talk about later in the year as well, do as well. So all of this stuff adds to the various different inorganic constituents dissolved in the water. And then of course from the atmosphere we have what we call atmospheric desolution. And basically that means is particles that are in the atmosphere dissolving into the water. Um, this happens from a number of constituents. If you think about volcanoes for example spewing ash into the air that can eventually get into the water. We also have things that wind that transports particulates around and deposits them in the water as well. This can be not only human made, but also nature as well. So it's kind of a combination. Now, of course, if we have all these inputs, you can say, well, isn't the ocean getting saltier and saltier and saltier? Well, the actual reality is, is it's not. And if the ocean is not getting saltier, that probably means that there's some sort of a balance between inputs of salts and removal of salts. And that seems to be the case. It probably took uh, estimates about 150 billion years or so to do that, but we're at that point now. 
And removing salt comes in several different forms. If you've ever been to the beach and parked your car on a windy day, you'll probably notice a salt crusty layer when you get back to your car a couple hours later. Well, sea spray will remove salts, obviously. There's also biological processes that remove salts, um, especially stuff like calcium and silica and other constituents. These are things that biological organisms use and make their exoskeletons and the shells out of. Uh, you also have a situation where different inorganic constituents can be absorbed and deposited onto the seafloor by various chemical processes. That's actually where a lot of the salts go. So either way, between the addition of salts and the removal of salts, we have basically an equilibrium, a bit, a bit of a steady state going on in the global ocean situation. But of course, there are variations in local areas. Now, I said before, the average ocean salinity is about 35 parts per thousand. But you can go as low as close to zero, all the way to above 40 or 50 in, in very arid, dry, high evaporation regions. And part of this local variation depends on two major things. The rate of evaporation and the amount of freshwater input in the particular area. Now, latitude can be a big teller as to what's going on in terms of the salinity. Various latitudes experience different rates of evaporation and precipitation um, just based on climate. An example of this would be the subtropics, which tend to have low precipitation and high uh, evaporation rates, and their ocean salinity tends to be high. Equatorial regions tend to have a lot of, a lot of precipitation and thus have a slightly lower ocean salinity. And of course, these aren't exact because various land masses and currents do affect precipitation rates in different areas. And you can kind of see globally on the diagram to the right, the various uh, salinity average profiles uh, from very low to very high. And where those high areas are tend to be areas that don't get a lot of precipitation, don't get a lot of freshwater input, and are very high evaporation rates. All right, the last little bit we've got to talk about has to do with dissolved gases in the ocean. Now, the three most common gases we talk about in the atmosphere are carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen, nitrogen being the largest portion thereof. We can similarly talk about these same three gases in water and their sources and where they come from and how they cycle through the environment. Because there is an exchange of gases at the sea surface, and this often has to do with how turbulent or mixed the layer is, the surface layer of the ocean is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in another lecture. But for right now, the processes that control dissolved gases getting into the ocean are, are several. First, the simple solubility of gas, uh, which is really the ability of a solute to dissolve in a solvent. CO2 is more soluble than oxygen or nitrogen because it forms carbonic acid in the water. And we're going to connect to that in another note set as well. Temperature has another effect as well. Colder water holds more gas than warmer temperatures do. Salinity is another factor because as uh, you dissolve gases in water, they tend to do so better in lower salinity water. And the last thing would be biological processes. Remember, photosynthesis takes away CO2 through that process. Respiration, on the other hand, produces CO2, and of course, decomposition produces CO2 as well. So now it's time to unlearn what you have learned. If hydrogen bonding did not occur between water molecules, would life exist on this planet as it does today? Explain with examples with examples, people. And until next time, keep thinking.